Welcome, welcome, patrons. Two weeks ago, we started to talk about the longest run of Dragon Age comics, the Dark Horse comics, which, not to say that they're the only Dark Horse comics, but they're the most popular. So today, we continue on with that journey with the second chapter, Those Who Speak. Now, I would recommend either reading the first chapter or watching the last video so you have some idea of the background of what's going on. So, assuming you have history. A lot of the background information I said for the last chapter still applies, so this will be short. Unlike the last chapter that was split into six issues, this chapter is split into three, even though it has about the same amount of pages. The first issue came out on August 22, 2012, about four months after the final issue of Chapter 1. The second issue was released on September 26 of that year, and the final issue on November 14, 2012. Most reviews put this higher than The Silent Grove, although people still grumbled about not finding Merrick in this chapter again. And that is yet another lead-up to another chapter. We also start seeing reviews that are questioning the decision that this important story be put into comics rather than a full novel, as people wanted more character development. There's also one grandma on Amazon who decided that these comics were too violent for her grandson and rated it one star. Those Who Speak Chapter 1 We start out with a monologue by Isabella, talking about the current setup. She has taken the job to take King Alistair Ferelden to Deventer to murder the man who has taken his father. Her crew wasn't happy to do so, although bribes of wine and coins seemed to tide most talk of mutiny. Isabella is talking to her first mate, telling him to keep an eye out for trouble while she is in the ball, which she's really going to hate. We then hear Varric friendly flirting with Maveris Talani, who we learn is both a magister and the widow to Varric's late cousin, Throold. Alistair is then introduced to her, and she flirts with him recklessly as well, to which Isabella teases him. Seeing Isabella, May then pulls aside a Lord Devon, who she describes as having lit up when hearing that Isabella was invited and wanted to help the group. As the group walks away, Devon and Isabella get to talk. It seems the two know each other already, but she has no wishes to speak to him. Cutting to May, Alistair, and Varric, the king asks May if Aurelian Titus was to show up to the ball, which she confirms, then asks why he is so interested in the man. Alistair replies that the man has committed acts of magical aggression against his country, to which Varric cuts in saying that it's actually personal. The trio continue to talk, with Alistair saying that May should leave once Titus arrives so that she doesn't get into trouble, which she dismisses. May then adds that it's odd that she couldn't find any information on Titus. He has no known family or lands, which is unusual for a magister of Deventer. All he has is a reputation for power and knowing things others do not. Cutting back to Isabella and Devon, Devon explains that he was asked by May to watch for her ship and keep it off any ship registries. He's also surprised to see that she is alive. He asks her for drinks later, which she aggressively denies. He then closes in on her, saying that she owes him. What would the king she is traveling with think if he knew about what happened on the Ventrication Sea? But then Isabella pulls out her knife, saying that nothing happened there, and forces him to walk away. Isabella then rejoins the trio of May, Varric, and Alistair. Still annoyed, Isabella quips if the Magister is pointing out her slaves, which May calmly responds that everyone has slaves in Tevinter, but then Magister Titus has arrived. Alistair then rushes to meet him, telling the others to be ready. He approaches him, asking if he recognizes Alistair, which he does not. When he brings up Merrick, Titus finally does as the tainted scion of Callan had. Titus welcomes Alistair to Tevinter, to which he only demands to know where his father is. Titus tries to use magic, which Alistair stops in some mix of a flash of light or a punch. It's not really clear. Either way, the Magister recognizes the move as Alistair being a Templar. The ballroom then erupts in a battle. While Titus flees, the Magister's people call out to May, saying that their fight isn't with her. She calls out to them, saying that she promised to protect these people and she will stand by her word. As her heroes slowly defeat the Magister's guards, Alistair calls out to keep one alive. Isabella rushes away to go capture one. She ends up finding a man trying to take Devon as a human shield behind some pillars. While he ends up injured, she is able to knock the man out. Devon begins to thank her, thinking his life was in danger, but she ends up murdering him anyway. When the others arrive, she lies to them, saying that the Magister's man killed him, but they do have their captive. May is upset, but tells the others to leave quickly. The guards will arrive soon, it will be better if she was the one answering the questions. Varric thanks her, and she kisses him on the cheek, telling him to be careful. One of the Magister shouted, Menaveris Dracona, or Long Live the Dragons, which means they are dealing with some sort of dragon cult, which is really never good. Alistair shakes her hand, saying that he'll be willing to help if she ever needs anything, while Isabella and Varric carry away their new hostage. We get another inner monologue. We get another inner monologue from Isabella, saying that their hostage didn't say much, but Varric was able to trick a location out of him. It seems that the Magister has a home on Saharon. Isabella talks to the first mate, who says that the crew is terrified of entering Canary lands. Isabella then says that Saharon is disputed between Canary and Deventer, so she isn't breaking any promises. 
She then says to him that she wants the crew to be scared of the Canari because they should be. Also keeps them sober. We cut to Alistair and Varric, who asks what the plan for Titus is, to which Alistair says that he doesn't have one. Suddenly, the alarm is raised. Two Canari dreadnoughts are coming up fast. Isabel springs into action, telling Alistair and Varric to take the lifeboat and run, but he refuses. Alistair apologizes to her for the trouble, but she tells him not to. Just fight. The battle then begins, Isabella calling out that there will be drinks for every horn they bring home. We then cut to two Canari, a male asking a Tamastrin what her wishes are. She orders him to take them captive. All of them. Chapter 2 We open with Isabella thinking to herself how she should have taken her own advice and avoid all Canari. They killed her old crew and almost killed her. Now they have her captured. She hasn't eaten in days, but if given the chance, she will fight. The Tamastrin comes in then, speaking Cunlot to another Canari. Isabel asks where her crew, Alistair, and Varric is, but her question is completely ignored. Instead, the Tamastrin asks her if she knows what the pot on the floor is. Isabella responds, no, which the Tamastrin calls out as a lie, and then states that it is Kamek. If Isabella and her fail to reach an understanding, it will be used to make her a Vidoth boss, or a mindless laborer. To begin, the Tamastrin asks Isabella her name. She responds with Isabella, and the Canari asks what her real name is. Isabella states that she won't cooperate, and the Tamastrin threatens her, saying that she knows that Isabella has done to her people, and if she was human, she would have her killed. But she is not. She's Canari. And they do not waste anything, even things of little worth. Isabella wonders why she even cares, as the Canari don't have names. The Tamastrin then explains that the Kuhn states that to call a thing by its true name is to know its reason in the world. To call it by the wrong name is to be blind to what it really is. She then goes on to say that the Canari do have names, names that are chosen carefully to explain who they are. Isabella questions what hers is, to which the Tamastrin explains that her full name will be hard for Isabella to pronounce and instead call her Rasan. Rasan then asks what the name Isabella means to her, which she explains that the name was given to her by a captain when she first signed on. It means little beauty and was a sort of joke. When Rasan asks what became of him, Isabella says that he died badly. Rasan questions why so many people around Isabella die, and we get both a flashback to what happened to this captain and a continuation on the scene. In the flashback, we learn that Isabella had killed the captain in anger, which sparks some sense of relief. While she was caught by the guard, she managed to escape. In the present, Isabella explains that this is what it means to be free, and she has no guilt of her past. Again, she asks what Rasan wants, and again, she wants her name. Isabella attacks her, yelling her to stop asking, but she is slapped away. Rasan leaves then, saying that her mistakes can be corrected, and there is a place for her. We cut to Varric and Alistair, who mention that it's been three weeks since their capture, and that there's been no word said to either of them that hasn't been in Cudnot. Varric then clues in Alistair, and also the reader, to the events at Kirkwall, that Isabella had stolen the tomb of Coslun, and their war leader, the Arashok, had died after invading Kirkwall for it. Just then, a Canari soldier opens the door, calling out that the Arashok, the new one, wants to see them. As Varric and Alistair walk through the camp, they begin to take notice in case of an escape attempt. But when they reach the Arashok, he calls out to Alistair that has been many years, Kadon. Alistair is surprised to see Sten, the man he had fought beside during the Fifth Blight. Alistair begins to ask questions, but Sten replies that Sten is no longer his title. He is Arashok. He then calls Alistair a fool. Titus obviously wants Alistair, and the man just wants to walk right into the Magister's trap, which Varric quietly points out that he said the exact same thing. Alistair then asks why he even cares. Arashok Sten then explains that, written in the Tome of Coslin, humans worshipped the old gods, and these dragons were like kings. The old gods would grant power in exchange for blood. Titus knows this history and wants to revive the cult of the old gods and gain power. Alistair then wonders what that has to do with him, which Aristoc Sten replies that he isn't sure. But either way, until Titus is stopped, Alistair will be a guest in the fortress, which we learned his name Akaz. Alistair reaches out and touches Arashok Sten and asks for more questions about Merrick's involvement in dragons, saying that Arashok Sten knows more than he is saying. But he strikes Alistair, saying that he is a Basilit An, an outsider worthy of respect, and for that, and that alone, him and Varric have been spared. Alistair calls out about Isabella's fate, to which he is told that he should be grateful for theirs, and to not speak to him again. We cut to Isabella sleeping in her cell, being awoken by Rassan, who asks her name again, and again she refuses, to which Rassan questions why it's so important not to tell her. Isabella thinks, and then asks what happened to her mother. 
Rasan asks for more information and that perhaps she could find out. We get a flashback to Isabella's childhood. She explains that she was raised in Ravain and the Canari were always around. Her mother began to believe in the Kune, started to say that slavery wasn't slavery if it was under the code. She believed every lie the Canari told her. But Isabella didn't want to join, and so she was sold to an Antivan merchant. And that was the last time she saw her mother. Rasan explains that her mother lightly works the fields of Parvalin, being treasured by all. Although without consulting the records far away, she isn't quite sure. She asks Isabella if she regrets the parting, to which she answers that she didn't like leaving it that way. Rasan wonders if her life would have been better if she had just joined the Kune, but Isabella says that she doesn't regret her life. She then goes on to say that after she escaped the man who had bought her, Louis, she joined the Felicima Armada, the pirate fleet. All the men feared or wanted her. There was nothing she couldn't have. Then she stole the Book of Coslin. Things got bad, but it was better after Kirkwall. Rasan questions why she had stolen the book, to which Isabella says it was just a job. Running a ship costs money, but Rasan isn't convinced. Something changed. Isabella goes on to say that there are little rules in the Armada, but you do have to pay your dues, and some cargo pays better than others. She didn't have a slave ship, but she did carry slaves. They came with Devon, the Armada's slaver from the north who enjoyed his business. While she needed distraction from the terrible job and it did work for a bit, they were caught by the Orlesian Navy. They hanged slavers. They needed to run. But Devon had packed the hold so tight the boat was slow. She tried everything to get the boat to go faster, but it just wouldn't work and Isabella wasn't going to die like that. So she dumped the cargo. Well, the slaves could have risen up and attacked them. They didn't. One by one, they were thrown into the sea. She tried to tell herself that they were better off free under the water, but Isabella is disgusted with herself. That day, Isabella swore never to take slaves again, and when she was tricked into another cargo of slaves, she freed them. But it cost her a lot of money, more than she could ever make, and that's why she took the job of stealing the book. Rasan tells Isabella that she was just doing what she had to, that it was the fault of her land, but it isn't too late for redemption. Inside, Isabella is a woman who is fighting the injustice, just as her mother did, to try and make things right. And she has a name. Isabella then tells her that the Canari are butchers. She won't be sorry for her. Then, Rasan grabs her, throwing her towards the Kamek, and says that all her names will then be erased, and welcomes her to the Kuhn. Chapter 3 Rasan yells at Isabella that she was given every chance at redemption, of having meaning in this world. But Isabella is able to slam Rasan to the floor, she is able to rush past the guards, steal a knife, and get away. Rasan then gets up, ordering the others to find her, and that she will have to tell the Aeroshock. We got to Alistair and Varric watching the guards rush around. Something is going on. Alistair wonders if a Tevinter war party is attacking, but Varric recognizes the sound. He knows as Isabella's doing. Just then, Isabella drops down the chimney covered in weapons. Varric wonders if running is a good idea, but Isabella argues that they have no choice. She quietly tells him to get Alistair out of here alive, as she needs to find her crew. While they could stay and become Canari, she wants to give them the real choice. And with that, she unlocks the door. Varric and Isabella quickly talk about escape plans, and finally, she says that if they don't meet again, good luck. Then she bursts open the door and begin to fight their way out. And here we have a bit of a split narrative going on at the same time, so let's follow Alistair and Varric first. They're able to find keys off of a guard and make their way out finally confronted by Aeroshock Sten themselves. Alistair calls out to Sten and mentions that it doesn't have to be this way, that they can fight Titus together. He attacks him, saying that his name is no longer Sten. He smashes down those weapons, almost hitting Alistair, and Varric complains that the sword he has given is no good compared to Bianca. The two rulers begin to fight as Varric opens the door behind them to find more Canary soldiers. He ends up charming them, lying to say that the Aeroshock had challenged Alistair to a duel, something about Basilit An, and that they shouldn't interfere. So the Canari soldiers and Varric end up watching the duel. Alistair ends up getting the upper hand with Aeroshock Sen, asking for it to be done, but he offers a hand instead of killing him. He won't kill his old ally. And they could be allies again. The Canari and Alistair can unite against Titus. Sen agrees, takes his hand, and says that, again, Alistair has proven himself. And let's jump back to Isabella's story. After parting ways near the boy's cell, she thinks that this is how she's abandoning her friends, for a useless, drunk crew. But they are her crew, and her responsibility, and she's a damn good captain. She ends up finding them locked up in cages in the floor. She finds her first mate, who we learned is named Brand. 
He asks her if this is a rescue, and she tells them it's close enough. And then she gives him the choice, a chance of freedom or stay and become Canari, saying that she hears the converts have a nice little life under the Kuhn. Bran questions that, saying that Isabella has said before that life under the Kuhn is terrible, but she denies this, saying that she said a lot in her past, but she wants them to have the choice. But Bran tells her that they want to fight. Just then, Rassan finds her. Rassan tells her that she knew she would find Isabella here. Her guilt wouldn't let her run away like that. Isabella then says that she would rather be dead than like her, so a fight begins. Rassan gets the upper hand, telling Isabella that she once admired her determination, her struggle against the terrible world she lived in, but now she sees that it has ruined her. Isabella fights for no reason. She is an animal now. She will rip her name from her. Isabella is able to turn the tide of the fight, now getting the better of Rassan, and as she chokes the canary, she tells her her real name, Naishe. She then stabs to the side of her head and leaves her instead of killing her. We then cut to Isabella on her ship. We get an internal explanation of what happened next. When the Canary found Isabella, her and her crew were locking up Rassan, but it turns out they didn't need to. Alistair and the Aeroshock had made a deal. There are questions if her boat will even float, but she assures them that the Canary, who had hauled the wreckage they made for spare wood, had fixed it all. Varric believes that the reason she actually wanted it saved was for the hidden gold aboard, to which she says, maybe. Meanwhile, Alistair and Aeroshock Sten discuss what happens next. Aeroshock Sten tells Alistair that he had asked a question before on why Titus wanted Alistair. He explains that Titus wanted him as he had the blood of dragons in his veins. Alistair is sure that is a mistake, which Aeroshock Sten agrees. Alistair wonders if his friend will tell him the theory in full, and he says that he will, but it might take some time. Alistair then replies that he will have to hear it another time then and calls for Isabella. She tells him that she's ready to go and that she isn't actually sure she's Isabella any longer. When Alistair is confused, she tells him that it's really only a name and she's looking at all of her options. We get another inner monologue from Isabella where she describes that later that night, Varric would come to her and ask if she needed to move on from this adventure. She describes that she wanted to help Alistair find his father because he deserves that chance. But after that, there are some things that are going to change. Discussion. The Venification Sea, which I think I am extremely butchering, is mentioned, so I just wanted to point out where it was on a map. There it is! In the library edition of this comic, Gator mentions that Isabella's outfit during the ball was actually from unused concept art from Isabella from the Trash Dragon Age 2 DLC that would eventually become Dragon Age Inquisition. Which now we all wonder why Isabella needed a new outfit, but I wonder if the others had similar outfit changes that were supposed to happen in this unused DLC. He also mentions that May's design and character is based on May West. I'm sorry you think more of your diamonds than you do of your soul. I'm sorry you think more of my soul than you do of my diamonds. <laughs> Speaking of May, she is Dragon Age's first real transgender character. Now granted, at the time of this comic's release, there wasn't much word on her gender identity until it's revealed in full in the third issue of this run, so I guess more on her later. When Magister Titus enters the room, Isabella begins to think about her time traveling the underground ruins of Kirkwall and how she used to hate it, but more so that being into Venture reminds her of that terrible place. Now, granted, those ruins are supposed to be into Venture in origin, so that may be why it reminds her, or maybe because both have hints of blood magic. Who knows? So something that I missed a while ago when talking about Alistair is that he is able to do a Templar move, which confused me. Templar abilities require Lyrium, and it's been a long time since he's done that. Turns out, I missed a line that explains it all. A couple pages later, he then tells Isabella that he thought he should get back into practice, so apparently he's been taking Lyrium on the side. Mystery solved. Random, but we get this interesting piece of dialogue between Alistair and Varric about Isabella. No idea what happened in Ostwick, though. Perhaps a fun fact, but Rassan is the first Canari woman that people saw in the series. She would actually be the only major female Canari character until either the Inquisitor you can make in Dragon Age Inquisition or the Vitisala in Trespasser. So we see some Kunlot in this comic, and a lot of it we don't know what it means. For example, here in this panel, the wiki suggests that this could be tra translated as leave us and as you wish. Although in the next panel, the Canari male is still there, sitting down a pot. Point is, we have no idea what this actually means, so don't take the wiki too seriously. But one translation we do get from Kunlat is that we get the translation for Tamasrin, literally, those who speak, which is also the title of this chapter. So while this comic makes it sound like Tamasrins are the ones in charge of translation from the king's tongue to Kunlat and also interrogates Isabella, the Iron Bull has a different take on them, expressing them more as mothers and teachers to the Canari. 
When we get a little bit about Isabella's past, where she explains about her mother, there is a little inner monologue box that adds the thought to little girl's jealousy when her mother was learning the cune. I'll be honest that this confused me for a bit, but I'm starting to think this means that the first reason that Isabella hated the Kuhn was that her mother was spending more time there than with her. From what Isabella talks about, it seems that she wasn't fond of her time at Kirkwall, although who knows if this would change if Isabella was romanced by Hawk. Either way, she describes her theft of the Book of Coslin as her fourth biggest mistake. No idea what the others are. Again, in a library edition, Gator mentions that the idea to make Sten the air shock was actually planned out during Dragon Age 2, but it never really came up in the series. While the first run of the series was about Alistair and his relationship with not only his father, but his duty as king, this one was really focused on Isabella and her guilt about her past. It seems that, even though Isabella has plenty of reasons to hate the Canari, this run-in with them seems to have helped her move past a lot of the guilt she has. At the end of this comic, she questions if she should keep the name Isabella, and what I think is a reference to how what has happened has affected her. But in the future of the series, so far, Isabella has been her name, so I don't actually think she ended up changing it. And the big reveal, we also get Isabella's real birth name, Naisha. Now, looking into the name as best as I can, the only reliable source of the name is that it's probably Zimbabwean origin and it means our king or god. I've also seen another report that it's Mexican in origin and means moonlight. And I've also heard about a dozen different pronunciations, including the one I have been using, Naishe. A couple other good ones are Naise, Naishi, and Naish. From my understanding, the version I have been using is the most common and I have been able to find people with the actual name pronounced it that way, although as we have never heard this pronounced in the series yet, this could change. Although to be quite honest, I am kind of fond of Naish. And that, dear patrons, is all that I have on the second run of the Dark Horse Dragon Age comics. And this series still needs a better group name than that, but that's all we get. Like last time, next week will be another lore video, and then the week after that will be the finale to the series, Until We Sleep. Do you still have any great questions, proof that I'm wrong, comments about your own fan theory? Feel free to tweet me at Echodathon on Twitter, or send a PM to user Gillanon on Reddit. 